Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry that uh, you don't have a, have a chance to get your coffee break because of the uh, time constraint. Well, this last session is basically to take stock and, uh, well, reflecting on the, the, the path that we have traveled so far and uh, look ahead and see whether the, uh, in what direction should be proceed. Well, financial inclusion is an uh, important policy objective for many developing and uh, emerging markets. And this is, of course, a major challenge because of its uh, complexity, uh, which is due mostly to its uh, you know, multi-dimensions. Uh, we've heard so far about uh, financial inclusion as an end, I mean, as a means versus an end. We've heard about uh, the important ingredients of the success in financial inclusion, and there are so many. Uh, we need to have the right mindset. We need to have the uh, readership, innovation, technology, uh, data uh, for uh, need identification, for the impact assessment, and the list goes on. And financial inclusion is closely uh, associated with the economic development and social uh, equity. And this, of course, is an objective that uh, governments and politicians uh, also want to pursue. And so with added players and uh, objectives, the role of policy makers and regulators in the area of financial inclusion become even more uh, challenging. And the, story, the difficulty does not just end there. In the, we don't uh, pursue financial inclusion in isolation. Uh, we have traditional policy objectives and, and uh, that includes uh, uh, financial stability, uh, financial integrity, and uh, consumer protection as well. So the, these are or the additional ingredients for added uh, challenges for policymakers and uh, regulators. But of course, with added uh, objectives, uh, we have added risks and added uh, opportunities as well. And uh, that's why the, so far uh, in the previous sessions, we've been discussing about uh, ways to or how to synergize uh, these policy objectives in order to optimize the impact, the outcome. Uh, what we have heard is that perhaps there are trade-offs, but uh, maybe not too much of a concern, uh, but we need to carefully manage uh, uh, the risk and mitigate the risk. But perhaps we can claim that we now have much deeper understanding about financial inclusion and that we have come a long way in promoting the financial uh, inclusion. This is, uh, of course, a very encouraging outcome, uh, but we know that we still have a long way to go. So perhaps it's a good opportunity at this point in this session to have some reflection on the path that we have traveled so far to see whether we are on the right track and uh, to do some stock taking in order to uh, sharpen our focus going forward. Uh, today, we have uh, four uh, panelists uh, here. I'll start with uh, Amma. Amma uh, Bhattacharya is the director of G24 uh, uh, Secretariat. And uh, Amma, you've been, you've been uh, closely associated with the financial inclusion issues and, in fact, uh, the RFI as well. Uh, this is my first time, in fact, to join the Global uh, Policy Forum. But it's really uh, great to see so much passion running in all these discussions. And uh, uh, you can actually feel that it's contagious. And uh, I'm sure, well, I think RFI uh, must be very happy that it's, it's able to play an important role in all this. Uh, but unlike me, Amma, you have been involved with financial inclusion and AFI, I think, from the very beginning. Uh, and you 
have seen the involvement of financial inclusion issues uh, from, from a national agenda, perhaps in a handful of uh, developing economies, uh, to a much wider constituency, and now to becoming a global agenda at the moment. So what do you think should be the direction of financial inclusion, uh, of the financial inclusion community going forward? And of course, that would also uh, shape the direction and the focus of, the, of AFI going forward as well. Um, thank you, Kuntarisa. Um, uh, just to start by saying that it's a real privilege to be here at this milestone meeting. Uh, the G24 is proud uh, that it is one of the earliest partners of AFI. Uh, we, in fact, hosted the launch of AFI. Uh, and at a personal level, um, you know, I'm particularly uh, privileged to have been working with Alfred even before the baby was born. Uh, uh, it's also uh, really a pleasure to be back here in Malaysia and, and Bank Nagara in particular. Uh, truly, Malaysia and Bank Nagara are sort of inspiring uh, examples of what we can accomplish in the developing world. Um, uh, as you uh, suggested, let me offer some reflections on the theme of this conference and the role of AFI. Uh, and I will do that on, ba on the basis of uh, the very, very rich uh, discussions we have had over the past two days and also the outcome of the deliberations of the leaders round table. Uh, the architecture that you know, uh, AFI has evolved in terms of the substantive agenda has three tiers right now. Uh, the first is commitments. Uh, and at the level of commitments, uh, you know, we started with the Maya Declaration, but we are now moving forward with the Sasan de uh, Declaration. And in that, it's not just reaffirming, but we are refining the approach to commitments by giving it greater precision, uh, by focusing uh, on more uh, indicators and also committing to monitoring it on a more systematic basis. The second level of the architecture that we have right now is uh, strategies. Uh, financial inclusion is a very special area because when you think about the breadth of the institutions that are involved, the complexity of the policies that are involved, strategy is not a simple task. And what's very, very important is this notion of coordination, the notion of leadership, and what Gov Governor Rahman yesterday say, said, which is the need to change mindsets. So the formulation, articulation, and implementation of strategies is the second part. And underneath that, we have this aspect of driving policies for, or for getting real impact, which is what we have been discussing uh, in, in, in these two days. And there, too, uh, it's important to say that, you know, when we talk about policies now, it's not a, just a simple case of refining this or refining that. As we started the session, I mean, our, our meeting, Bill Gates said what we are looking at is a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift is made possible because of two factors, digitalization, and the communications revolution. Those two make possible things that we wouldn't have dreamt about a few years ago, but they are also pose enormous challenges. It's not just a question of tweaking policies, it's actually a case of re re revolutionizing institutions. And there are several, re uh, several aspects of this that have come through in the discussions here. The first is the changes in the infrastructure for financial inclusion. As we have heard, the first thing that where there is enormous prospect for change is in the payment system. And that offers huge improvements in connectivity and huge benefits in terms of reduced cost. Second, the, the playing field for institutions is changing dramatically because of this revolution. We are creating a more level playing field and we are basically setting the basis for much greater contestability and competition. The small are no longer disadvantaged with respect to the big. You can get a lot more uh, competition, energy, 
commitment coming out of small players that would not have been possible in previous periods. Third, the same revolution is providing us information now on a real-time basis that would not have been possible. It's revolutionizing credit bureaus. In a previous session, we heard how you can now get information on consumers that is much more refined and where you even don't visit the consumer. You can use lots of techniques now to improve information. But all of these changes are also posing challenges for regulation and the legis legislative basis for it. How do you set regulation for financial intermediaries where intermediaries are no longer financial institutions? How do, how do you coordinate between the regulation of banks and the regulation of, of telcos? How do you deal with uh, non-bank financial institutions? And a very, very important theme here has been how do you link the objective of financial inclusion with the other objectives of financial stability, financial integrity, consumer protection. And I will come back to that. <clears throat> the third aspect that where, again, the revolution is taking place is with respect to data, with respect to measurement, and with respect to evaluation of impact. Why is evaluation of impact so important? In my view, for two reasons. One is, when you listen to what countries are doing, there are quite different models out there. And while we want to celebrate diversity, as a third country, I want to learn which one is working better than the other. So it's very important for us to have evaluation and systematic, systematic evaluation as part of our toolkit. And there is no better place to do that than AFI. Second, we want to learn from experiments. And we heard yesterday from the innovation uh, of the poverty that there are many, many uh, you know, experiments that are going on. And there is feedback taking place in real time. So it's very important to have this third aspect. And the fourth aspect where, again, the same changes and revolutions in technology can make a big difference is financial literacy. This whole system will not work without financial literacy, but the same technology, the same kind of techniques and the, and the information revolution can allow kids, for example, on their iPads or in a simple way in, the, in their schools or whatever to become much more literate and for farmers to learn how to use those cell phones as we have, have been talking about today. There's another aspect in closing that I want to highlight, which is while AFI and the work of AFI empowers and enables us at the national level, another very important aspect that AFI provides us is the ability to engage in the international scene on particularly the issue of international standards. And that was the discussion of the leaders round table. In the spring, uh, the G24 and AFI had uh, organized a policymakers round table based on a paper that Kuntarisa had, had prepared. And the essence of that paper was that you need to take a very a proportionate and sensible approach when you approach international standards. We heard yesterday that there are, or everybody agreed that there is a degree of trade-offs in terms of these different objectives that we have in mind of in, uh, financial inclusion, uh, uh, stability, uh, integrity, and consumer protection. Moreover, those trade-offs are not the same everywhere. They vary from place to place. And so it's very, very important in thinking about international standards and to go, get to that point that we were discussing in the panel yesterday, how do we get synergy to understand where the rubber hits the ground, where do stand, how, what can we learn from the implementation of standards. And there are really three aspects here. One is learning from the practice of individual countries. The second is not looking at it in silos within countries or across standards, but in an integrated way. And third is to take into account other factors. For example, you know, there are other risks out there. There's a risk, for example, of over-indebtedness. There's a risk that if you put too many standards, you will create more incentives for shadow institutions. And third and most important, you create risks of financial exclusion. 
So it's important in this agenda to take an integrated view. Yesterday at the leaders uh, round table, the, there was overwhelming support that there is great value in peer learning and peer dialogue on this, uh, in this area based on the very, very useful work being done by the working group and on the basis of other work that's also being done. So this kind of peer learning and peer dialogue can help individual countries, of course, sharpen their own policies, but it also is important to stress that it gives us a collective view on how these standards are operating. It gives us a collective view of you know, where there is greater synergy and what are some of the problems that are arising in the implementation of standards. Based on that, we can have a second part, which is a two-way exchange with the standard setters. And here you can do it at an individual stand with an individual standard setter, and we will hear from Carl on the, on the, on the very important case uh, of BCBS uh, in a little while. But you, there are also other standard setters out there. And this is basically to be able to get the information that is being collected by the standard setters to benefit our dialogue and also to provide the benefits of our peer learning and peer dialogue to facilitate the discussions in the standard setters. But beyond the one by one standard setters, it's also important for us to think about how do we interact with the dialogue that is already there amongst the standard setters in this very important issue and to think about how do we bring the financial inclusion uh, perspective from our countries to the debate. There is a third level which came out from the dialogue uh, you know, in, in uh, Washington but has also been reinforced since and that is that ideally we would like to develop an even broader framework which takes into account not only these risks but the other risks that I mentioned including, most importantly, how do we proactively ensure that we are not contributing to financial exclusion. And we have called this the extended risk framework. So we hope that as we develop the work, we will set the basis for something that is even more ambitious, which is really a <coughs> framework to, uh, uh, of an extended risk framework that is comprehensive and that in some sense looks at the most important risk of all as far as we are concerned, which is the risk of financial exclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arma. Well, you have read our very comprehensive uh, architectural framework of the financial inclusion. But I'll come back to you later about the earlier question that I posed, and that is the uh, future direction of the financial inclusion community uh, going forward. Uh, well, uh, Arma has talked about uh, the role of the, well, the need to engage and to work closely with uh, SSBs, standard setting bodies. I'd like to post uh, my question to the next uh, panelist here. Uh, we have Carl uh, Cordovina. He is the Deputy Secretary General, Basel Committee for the Banking the Supervision. Uh, Basel Committee has the uh, issue guidance on the financial inclusion as well, and uh, I think the, we have to congratulate the uh, Basel Committee for their recognition of the need to uh, apply risk in a way which is uh, proportionate. Sorry, to apply a, a standard in a way that is proportionate to risk. Uh, because earlier our the, uh, there were concerns that uh, the uh, you know the traditional financial uh, instability or financial systemic uh, risk that uh, uh, we are usually uh, concerned about is more applicable to the traditional banking sector, but for smaller financial institutions, smaller the financial institution uh, financial inclusion service providers the risk of financial uh, instability or systemic risk is probably uh, much smaller. And uh, BCBS has uh, very well recognized uh, this uh, significant difference. And uh, uh, that's why the idea of proportionality has been uh, uh, very well uh, utilized 
in that guidance. But the concept of uh, proportionality is not difficult to understand. But the implementation of proportionality is. And this is an issue that uh, uh, brought us to the conclusion that perhaps the peer learning would be very uh, uh, important. So on this issue, I'd like uh, Carl to tell us a bit about your uh, takeaway, your reflection from the leaders' roundtable uh, yesterday. And uh, are you, well, we know that there are uh, trade-offs between different objectives, but perhaps they are manageable. But uh, are you concerned about the potential trade-offs of the two uh, objectives? And uh, uh, how should uh, the financial inclusion community through AFI work closely uh, with the standard setters going forward? so that we can both achieve the objectives that we have in mind. Thank you very much, Teresa. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today and to share with you some views related to the work of the Basel Committee as far as financial inclusion is concerned. Uh, I also thought I should, uh, should, should a bit talk about possible ways of cooperation with, uh, with AFI members. In, in this context. But I also uh, wanted to, to thank uh, Bank Negara for so excellently hosting this forum here. And I'm not only talking about the forum, I also wanted to include the dinner yesterday, which was really fascinating. Uh, not only the food, but also the performances, I'm, I must say. <laughs> uh, I mean, as uh, Teresa already mentioned, I mean, I, part I participated in yesterday's uh, leaders' roundtable, and I can only agree with, with Arma. It was, I mean, really a very interesting discussion yesterday we had. And I, I again, I mean, whenever I, I attend, I mean, a forum, a symposium, a meeting on financial inclusion, I've, I've again learned a lot, and I must admit I'm, I'm still uh, on the learning curve as far as financial inclusion is concerned. I mean, fortunately enough, uh, we've, uh, I think it was already mentioned, we have established a work, uh, a work stream on financial inclusion and we got real experts on, on this, uh, this work stream, like Nestor Esprinia, I've seen him here, and also Tim Lyman. Uh, uh, Maybe, but up front, let me just say that I can only speak here for the banking supervisors. I mean, there are a couple of standard setters, maybe six or, or, or seven or so, but uh, the Basel Committee is engaged in, uh, in banking supervision and regulation, and therefore I can only speak in my capacity as a representative of the Basel Committee, and therefore only on banking supervision. Uh, Maybe I can, can start with and briefly summarizing, and I try to be brief, and particularly what you can't see. I mean, I have a clock just in front of me, which is a countdown clock, and I don't know what's <laughs> going to happen when it turns to zero, and therefore I'm a bit concerned here. <laughs> uh, and I mean, let me just summarize what the Basel Committee does on financial uh, inclusion, and not only what it currently does, but also just to highlight uh, what we have done in the past. Uh, we've been engaged in financial inclusion, I would say, for around six years right now. I've seen outside, I mean, uh, AFI has, has started its work, and I may, may not remember it correctly right now, approximately 14 years ago or so. I hope this was correct. I mean, there was a very interesting uh, uh, outside. I mean, I could see about the history of, of AFI, which was, I mean, I must say, very interesting. And uh, six years ago, we started, and this work, this was also undertaken in our outreach group. At that time, it was the International Liaison Group. And this work, uh, uh, the, or the, the end product of this work was the release of a document on the application of our core principles for effective banking supervision uh, to microfinance activities. Therefore, the scope at that time was narrower than it is right now. 
now, now our focus on, is on financial inclusion. The focus uh, some five, five uh, to three years ago was more on microfinance activities. And uh, we also have organized in, in Basel a couple of meetings which were co-chaired by uh, Queen Maxima and the chairman of the, of the Basel Committee, where we discussed issues uh, relevant for financial inclusion between uh, the standard setters and, and also some stakeholders like CGAP or AFI, the World Bank, and, and so on. In uh, November last year, we established a work stream on financial inclusion, which is now part of, uh, of our main outreach group, which is the Basel Consultative Group. The committee was expanded in 2009. Originally, we had 13 member countries. We now have 27 member countries. And I mean, in, uh, in 2009, we invited 14 new member countries. And I think it's, it's of, of interest here that some of them are, are really, I mean, to a large extent, <coughs> interested in, uh, in financial inclusion. Uh, for example, we got India, we got Brazil, we got uh, Indonesia, we got Argentina and Mexico on the group. And I hope on the committee now, and I hope I haven't forgotten any now. Uh, within the Basel Consultative Group, we discuss issues which are relevant for the committee with uh, some jurisdictions which are not members of the Basel Committee, like Malaysia, and also the World Bank, the IMF, the Islamic Financial Services Board, and also with some regional groups of, of banking supervisors. Uh, the work stream, which is, I mean, a really very important part of the work of the Basel Consultative Group, uh, focuses on identifying and managing opportunities and challenges in proportional uh, prudential regulation and supervision. And again, I mean, this, this word proportional was already mentioned a couple of times, and this is very important. I mean, we revised our core principles for uh, effective banking supervision just recently, and uh, up front you find a paragraph just on proportional uh, uh, regulation and supervision, which is now an, a very important element of our work. Uh, the, the work stream is uh, carrying out two activities this year. Uh, we send a, a range of practice survey to approximately 80 jurisdictions, and we expect the final, uh, the final uh, uh, comments to, to come in very soon. And uh, in this context, uh, uh, overnight I, I got an email from Tim Lyman and he asked me, I mean, to, uh, to, to just, I mean, ask individual countries. I won't name them right now, and therefore, more in, in general terms, I mean, if you haven't uh, responded to our survey yet, please, uh, I, I would really uh, very appreciate it. We would very appreciate if you could do so. Uh, the, uh, the other activity we are carrying out is based on the outcome of this, uh, this, this survey. We are going to prepare a revised version of our 2010 uh, guidance paper on microfinance activities and the core principles for effective banking supervision with, uh, as I already mentioned, a broader scope, not only microfinance, but financial inclusion. Uh, when we, when we discussed these issues yesterday at the round table, I mean, there was also, I mean, references were made, I mean, how can we better cooperate with, uh, with AFI member countries? And a couple of very good ideas were raised in, in this context. And uh, I think it's very important, I mean, to continue our di dialogue. I mean, we have started this dialogue and we have increased this dialogue over the, over the last couple of years. And I think uh, uh, Ama was, was completely right when he said earlier 
there should be a two, we need a two-way dialogue. Not only, I mean, I'm speaking to you here, but I mean, we, we need to get feedback. And this is, I think, very important. We have to think about how to more formalize, I mean, this process of, of engaging in, in, in a dialogue. I mean, a couple of ideas were, were raised yesterday in this context. Uh, one was, I mean, maybe there's going to be another meeting between standard setters and, and uh, the, the, the other stakeholders, and maybe on the, on the following day, I mean, maybe we could have a separate session with, with some AFI members or so. I mean, I'm a bit thinking loud here and a bit referring to what was discussed yesterday. But there may also be other opportunities to more formalize our dialogue. Uh, maybe I can stop here. I think I've already spoken for too long. And my apologies and thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you very much, Carl. Well, certainly uh, <coughs> you are right in saying that continued dialogue is the way to go. Uh, we have uh, just starting to formalize our the working relationship. And uh, I think uh, AFI can uh, play a coordinating role in the uh, with, the, uh, with the survey that the work stream is, is working and uh, uh, not many AFI members are part of the uh, Basel committee, nor the, the working group, nor the work stream. So the, I certainly see the value of the working closely together so that uh, we can get more the input, more feedback to where. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me uh, move on to the, the next point, uh, I'd like to the, turn to Brian Pomeroy on my left. He's the, uh, currently the, uh, one of the uh, AFI associates, but uh, formerly he was the chair of the UK Financial Inclusion uh, Task Force. And, uh, well, I'd like to uh, ask you the, about your uh, view uh, with regard to uh, consumer protection and uh, uh, financial uh, education. Uh, uh, we've heard comments so far about, uh, uh, from some of the uh, participants, uh, speakers, that uh, one of the major challenges for the deepening of financial inclusion is, in fact, financial literacy and uh, uh, financial education. Well, how important do you see the role of consumer protection and uh, financial education in deepening financial inclusion? Well, that's maybe a simple answer. But uh, what role should it be in consumer protection and financial education? Uh, for the financial protection, I think uh, perhaps everyone would agree that it should be the role of the, the public sector, and that includes uh, consumer protection agency or the central bank or the regulator but uh, it's perhaps debatable with uh, respect to the second point, you know, who should be uh, playing the, uh, the role, the leading role in uh, consumer education and increasing uh, consumer literacy. Uh, yesterday, we saw a number that 66% uh, of the audience were of the opinion that financial education should be the role of policy makers and regulators. Well, although uh, this obviously uh, was the biggest vote, it means that the remaining 34% uh, didn't think so. So the, the, what is your view on this, and should and could the private sector have a role to play okay. in this area? Certainly. Well, firstly, can I say I too am honored to be here. Um, it's the second GPF I've attended. I was at Mexico two years ago, so I have two data points. Uh, and I don't cease to be impressed and marvel, frankly, at the progress AFI has made in that period. Um, I think your question is a very important one. And probably, if you had to, say, ask, well, of all the things that are going on, what's the biggest risk to financial inclusion being successful in the longer term? The greatest risk, actually, I think, is that consumer protection lags behind all the other good initiatives, rolling out a new products and bringing people into... Um, financial inclusion. And the reason is simply that, almost by definition, 
people coming into financial services the first time are vulnerable. They're vulnerable because they've never been there before and therefore inherently will be less knowledgeable, less trusting, less confident in the product. They're also vulnerable because they'll typically be people on low incomes who can't afford to bear costs if things go wrong. So financial, um, uh, for, for, uh, consumer protection is absolutely vital. And sometimes, going back to the discussion we heard yesterday about conflicts between you know, the I, the S, and the I, and the P, uh, sometimes people, particularly providers of products, do say, well, there's a conflict between inclusion and consumer protection, because if you regulate it too hard you know, on products which probably are not going to be very profitable at the beginning anyway, you'll stifle us. And I would say the opposite, actually. I would say... Uh, that if you don't regulate sufficiently, and of course I mean proportionately, there is a risk that down the line there will be scandals and people will lose money, and people whose confidence is inherently fragile because they're new to financial services will simply say, well, you know, that wasn't a very good idea, and they'll simply stop um, having uh, trust in it. So I think financial, uh, uh, fin uh, consumer protection is absolutely vital, and I think there is a risk that in the enthusiasm, the euphoria to bring people into financial services, that might get left behind. Um, on financial education and financial literacy, financial capability, um, that too is vital. It's a much more difficult, frankly, a generational problem. It's not something that can be solved overnight. And of course, we must uh, you, you know, you provide education to young people, although there is you know, an argument that says education is best applied at points in your life when you need it. So not necessarily when you're simply in school and don't have any need for it, but you know, uh, when you first get a job, when you are mar marry, when you have your first child. So deciding when to apply it, I think, is very important. And there are some sceptics. Uh, about whether it's valuable to give financial education to children. I happen to think you should. But the fact is, even if you do that with young people, there are many people who did not receive financial education at school who will be on this planet for many years, and you have to do something for them. And that means, inevitably, I think, regulation will have to take the strain. But nonetheless, there are things that you can do. Um, there are ways of um, bringing... Um, financial capability to be perhaps at the time when they take on new products to have financial education perhaps bundled <coughs> with that product or at least offered to them. Um, there are other channels as well. Um, on the question of who should be responsible for it, I, I was at the session you referred to and I noticed that everybody said the government. I think there is a distinction between who is responsible and who delivers it. I think governments are responsible for making sure it happens. Somehow, I don't think that necessarily means that governments are responsible for delivering it. Of course, the private sector has a role. I think financial service providers have a role, partly perhaps uh, under their corporate social responsibility banners, but also, frankly, as they provide products. Why shouldn't you, when you provide a product for the first time to someone who hasn't used it, also bundle that, at least with the offer of some training and um, capability in how to use that product? So I would say it's government's role. This is too important to let go. Um, it's government's role to make sure it happens. If I could add one last point, in a sense, the best protection for consumers are properly working markets, markets that work properly, um, you know, markets where there is competition and providers are competing with each other to do a good job for their customers. I was very interested, I've only heard the word competition mentioned once in the last two days, and it was actually Governor Zetter who mentioned it. Um, and she said it was important to have competition. It wasn't mentioned by anyone else, and I don't know how high that is on AFI's agenda. But the fact is, if you do think that competitive markets are a very important way of protecting consumers, you have to also recognise there's two sides to a market. It isn't enough to have a competitive supply side. You have to have a demand side, which is educated sufficiently to act as consumers, switch products, make decisions, which is very, very difficult, um, and will only come... I think over a long period as financial capability uh, takes hold. But I think it is vital, as I say, I think ultimately it's governments and public bodies whose responsibility it is to make sure that somebody puts it in place. Thank you. If I may uh, ask you another question. Uh, you, uh, p from your perspective and experience working uh, at the uh, UK, do you see grounds for peer learning between developed countries and AFI members in these areas? Uh, certainly. I think there's, uh, there's scope in many, many areas, you know, whether it's in consumer protection, uh, whether it's in new, new, new delivery models, such as some of the ones we heard about this morning of the mobile um, 
presentation, whether it's in institutional arrangements for bridging the gap, if you like, between government, um, the, the financial services institutions, financially excluded people and NGOs by some sort of you know, administrative machinery that brings them together, um, where there's experience on both sides. I think um, there is great scope. And I think, by the way, each side probably thinks there isn't much scope at the moment, um, but doesn't recognise that each side has something to offer and to learn from the other. Good, thank you. Well, the, I'd like now to turn to the, the speaker on my right, uh, Ms. Naomi Ngvire. She is a deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of uh, Malawi. Well, you are the only regulator among the speakers here. So I'd like to uh, get your view about uh, the role you see for a central bank in enabling further financial inclusion. It's very important that we need to have uh, an enabling the supervisory regime. How, how do we come about in doing that? Can you share with us some of your uh, okay. opinions? Well, um, thank you. Um, when I was considering the, um, the topic, optimizing uh, impact, um, I, I quickly, you know, find myself navigating uh, my academic knowledge of optimizing. And uh, I was fascinated by the first presentation where there was a diagram with blocks and a uh, policy either uh, you know, contributes to something or not, and there's synergy, and so there's optimization. And so my mind went into fast track about some of the analytical frameworks that we use in economics and financial markets for optimization. And I thought I could use that as a way of illuminating the discussion on how we can do policies that uh, optimize uh, uh, financial inclusion, given that there are other um, variables we have to take account of. And what would be the role of a central bank in that kind of context? So I am talking mostly from uh, the point of view of a country like Malawi, which is starting on most of these things and the challenges that it faces. Uh, in Malawi, I think also in other countries, the main issue would be to clarify, first of all, um, who is the champion for financial inclusion. Um, and this relates to who is in charge of this aspect or that aspect. Um, but I think a sitting together and clarifying who is the leader or the champion, even if it might be for various aspects of financial inclusion, is an extremely important one. Uh, in some cases, we're just proceeding without that uh, uh, duty bearer or that uh, team leader. So that would be task number one. Uh, in Malawi, it's not the central bank right now. It's not clear. Um, although we play aspects of regression, which have an impact on financial inclusion, that is not clear. So I think that is something that we have to go home as a central bank, as a monetary authority and a regulatory authority to clarify. But once we have clarified that, then how do we structure the problem so that we can apply issues of optimization to it? And I thought that the traditional concept that you want to maximize a desirable attribute or minimize a negative attribute, the programming sort of setup of a, of a problem subject to certain constraints is one which we can use. And in this case, we want to optimize on a financial inclusion index, which is a component of many aspects of access to various financial inclusion products. But we have a safety first sort of goal. So our maximization will have a safety first goal. And the safety first goals are on um, integrity, stability, and protection. And so we have to specify the minimum amounts of this. Now I'm going to come up to illustrate how a central bank or a champion can now lead the process of formulating policies and activities to inform this uh, problem that has been uh, formulated. And in the usual format, when we are maximizing, whether it's in economics or in finance, we have a portfolio of activities. And these are our financial inclusion activities. They have inputs and outputs. And they are subject to budgets uh, or to technologies. And uh, once we have formulated it like that, the question is, what is the role of a central bank when defining um, what you want to maximize? What is financial inclusion? You need here to do 
baselines and strategic planning. If the champion is the Minister of Finance and they have a strategic plan, you need a baseline. You need to plan in country to take that agenda forward. Now, the activities themselves, which are the, the, the where we derive financial inclusion, whether it's in mobile phone services, whether it's banks, um, they have input and output relationships. Now, each one of those, the productivity of each one of those activities is impacted by regulation. So, policies relating to regulation are very important. Particularly, uh, the productivity of that activity. Some regulations will dampen productivity, so banks <coughs> have to be careful on that. But also technology. Technology is sometimes under the control on the government side, but sometimes uh, it is also under the control of central bank. What sort of technologies are there? Are we investing in technologies? Those are important for providing financial inclusion uh, services. Uh, infrastructure is important in that aspect. Um, the safety first goals in this problem must be defined, and it is usually the role of the central bank to define them. What is stability? What is the minimum level of stability we want? And here there's also a link to standard setting bodies. Uh, we must dialogue. The proportionate idea is extremely important because our safety first goals have to be based on what is acceptable risk. The issue of return and risk, that is important in financial uh, management. Integrity, what is the minimum level of integrity? Protection, what are the minimum levels that we can't do without? I think that central banks should avoid setting standards that are too high, uh, that uh, wholesale borrowed from uh, standard setting bodies that are, cannot optimize our situation for financial inclusion. So it is the role of the central bank to interrogate these concepts, to make sure that uh, uh, they can lead us to greater financial inclusion. And uh, in all this, there is a role for measurement, a role for information for data, because to do this, you have to know where you are coming from and where you are going. To optimize, you have to have some metrics of it. And this brings the debate of uh, yesterday about measurement, measuring impact, which also means that we have to have baselines. It's extremely important that we understand uh, the, the, the production function itself of financial inclusion, of the various financial inclusion activities, how inputs generate outputs, but also that we know where we are starting from and where uh, uh, we are going to end. But I would like to emphasize my caveat of yesterday in another forum that we can't measure everything. Uh, even as we must measure and must understand where we are going, um, not everything that we are going to achieve, all the good things that we achieve can be measured in, 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 in after two or three years uh, because it's also about social engineering and some of the benefits in terms of social benefits are going to come in the long term. I was giving the example of... Uh, my sister-in-law who joined the microcredit program, and uh, to all our you know, observation, her economic situation has not changed, but many things about her changed because she was engaged in formal side of uh, the economy. She, appreciated, she, she began to appreciate certain things that she didn't know. She started transferring certain values to her children. She became less dependent on us, so that her level of uh, you know, self-reliance inculcated certain things in her that will only show up in her children. So we, we may not be able to measure everything, but we should still attempt to measure what is measurable. And I think that's the way forward. If you want to optimize, we have to be able to measure what we want to achieve with that caveat. So the role of the central bank then is to define, uh, to help define how to measure some of these variables um, uh, to, to, to facilitate the financial sector to enter into data collection, measurement, so that we can know whether we're optimizing or not. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I think your discussion has further highlighted mm. the complexity and the difficulty in doing financial, conclusion, uh, financial inclusion. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, maybe well, it's one of the two uh, questions that I have for all the speakers to uh, answer. 
Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so you don't have to order. Uh, you don't have to uh, answer both, but uh, just pick one. Uh, the first one is that, uh, well, please make a recommendation for an area of work that the Alpha Network should work on or focus on between now and the next global policy <laughs> forum, uh, in order to facilitate more info informed uh, decisions at the next uh, meeting. And uh, perhaps the, your discussion uh, would point to certain areas that we need to focus on uh, mm -hmm. going forward. Uh, another the question that I have is, what are your expectations for AFI? And of course, this is very much related to the future direction of the financial inclusion community as well. Please, uh, in any order, would like to start first? Well, I, Please. If I can just Brian. answer the first of your questions. Okay. Um, I was really interested in the, I think it was the first plenary session took place yesterday, which was about how you deal with trade-offs, or are they really trade-offs? Can you turn trade-offs into a sort of synergistic opportunity? I thought that was really interesting, because the fact is there are trade-offs, and many of the, of the, very often they work against the interests of consumers. But what I didn't get from that was the concrete how to do it and the examples of how. So I, it, it, my ask, if I had the, the privilege of being able to ask, would be that Afi turns that into some practical ideas about how you do what sounded to me like a really interesting and potentially fruitful idea. Okay, basically how to turn <clears throat> the risk into opportunity. Yes, in a more concrete way. In a more concrete way. Amma? Yeah, so the, the discussion of the turning the, the risks into opportunities is very much linked in those areas to the discussion of the application of international standards and how do you do it at the country level. So my, uh, I would put very much, therefore, at the top of it, really this peer learning, peer exchange, uh, and interaction on, on this issue of uh, standards and national policies. Uh, second, I, I think uh, what I was trying to do was to show that AFI has made a very, very deep difference to the nature of the conversation, and what we now need to do is to build on that and produce, in some sense, the results in the different areas so we can get concrete uh, results at the country level and at the global level. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would say that um, in some countries, it's a question of accelerating what has already started in other countries. So AFI could really help to ex uh, extend the learning or, or the coping from those who are succeeding to those who are not understand what are the constraints in their input output for you know, supplying financial inclusion products, and then help to deal with the policies that can solve those constraints and the activities that can accelerate the expansion of financial inclusion. Okay. That's an area of priority. Thank you. Huh? <clears throat> Thank you, Teresa. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, I'm, since I've dealt with uh, financial inclusion and also in relation of our standards, I mean, it would be good to find out what concretely uh, your concerns are with respect to our standards, the Basel Committee standards. And also, I mean, the second uh, stream could, could also be, I mean, to clarify a, a bit further what a proportionate approach really means. I mean, this is one of those words, I mean, which sometimes, I mean, I, I get the impression they sound very, very good. But I mean, it's, I mean, when, when you talk to five people, you probably get six different ideas what a proportionate approach really means. Yeah, because this community is so diverse. So the peer learning would help yeah. uh, both yeah. sides. Uh, standard setter would learn from us, mm. and then AFI members would learn from the mm. standard setter and from each other as well. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I think we need to, we should get some uh, questions from the floor. Just maybe a couple of them. Yeah. Please, Governor. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to add one question. Uh, uh, this is related to the issues raised by both Amar and, and others on the uh, you know, risk uh, framework and also on consumer protection. I thought in developing countries, uh, countries, you know, the farmers are the most vulnerable ones, and they're the ones who face 
a lot of uh, you know, you know, you know, uh, pressure from the market and also from uh, uh, other exclusions. So uh, can I raise, uh, a, a, can you uh, put a suggestion uh, like this? Can you suggest of you taking initiative of developing a workable risk mitigation model for agricultural finance in the form of a crop insurance scheme where private sector insurers but uh, uh, partner effectively with governments who are subsidizing agriculture in one form or the other to influence food prices, which cannot be left wholly to markets given implications for food security and farm jobs. So this is a concrete suggestion I want to make annuity because uh, the last session I heard on the financial and agriculture finance also brought out these this issues and it, this has got implications for consumer protection and risk mitigation right. framework as well. So that's my concrete suggestion for moving forward in the next, next uh, phase. Thank you very much for the suggestion. I think it's a good one and uh, I'm sure uh, AFI members have uh, various <coughs> experiences in this area that we can share with each other. Uh, another question, please, from the floor. Yes. Please. Hi, Dave Grace. A uh, question or kind of response about a, a concrete example of where the standards are making it difficult and, and proportionality. So within Basel III, there's a very specific opportunity and recognition, I think, attempt for proportionality to allow savings banks, cooperatives, mutuals to recognize their share, their cooperative shares as part of common equity tier one. So it was a great attempt, but in the first, uh, there have been five assessments done by the Basel Committee of implementation of the standards. And in two of the five so far, they've said, you can't do this. So here's an example, Basel Committee, I think, went the right way and said, we're making an accommodation. Now in an assessment, they're saying you can't do it. And so there's other regulators right now that are looking at this and saying, you know, here's an example of maybe being proportional, but it <coughs> seems like in the assessments, this isn't allowable. And, you know, so there's one concrete example. Other examples are really when there are FSAPs done. And so those FSAPs, you know, very clearly hold regulators against core principles of banking supervision, insurance, et cetera. And regulators, especially of NBFIs, don't want to vary in those FSAPs. So, you know, some, some examples. Well, maybe this is a disconnect between the guidance and the assessment. But uh, I think this is an area that uh, we are well aware of, both the Santa Seta and AFI uh, members. So, well, would you like to uh, respond briefly, Carl? Yeah. I mean, Dave, as you know, I mean, this is well known in the, in the committee and we also discussed this, this issue. I mean, we try to accommodate with a footnote in Basel III under the definition of capital, the situation of in particular of cooperative banks. I mean, the dilemma we are facing here is when you, when you look at the introduction of Basel III at the very end, there's something about scope of application and we say, this document, Basel III, is for internationally active banks. Our focus is on internationally active banks. But we have been the victim of our, our own success here. I mean, of course, as you all know, Basel I, Basel II, and now probably Basel III as well, has been implemented uh, not only to internationally active banks, but also to, to other banks. And, I mean, you, you should have uh, two separate rules, one for international for really the big players and another rule, I mean, for all others. And even, I mean, you, you should even differentiate between these all others. I mean, the regional banks, the small banks, the credit unions, the cooperatives, they are microfinance institutions, I mean, and, and so on and so on. And, I mean, here, I mean, we, we really need a proportionate approach. And how it looks like, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it needs to be discussed. But, uh, I mean, 
I'm always a bit hesitant to talk about, I mean, individual jurisdictions or group of groups of jurisdictions like the EU, but the EU has implemented a Basel III in a way that it applies to all banks, and there's one rule which applies to all banks. And here, I mean, our criticism is, is, is not about, I mean, the cooperative banks. The criticism is more about, I mean, that this also applies to the, let's say, the global players, the international active banks. Thank you very much. Well, we are five minutes behind schedule, so uh, I think we have to end this session. AFI and the financial inclusion community have received some uh, requests, suggestions uh, for future homework. So I think uh, at this point, I'd like to invite all of us to give a big hand to our panelists here. I'd like to end the session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. I would like to remind you that we